Uh, I'm so excited to get to interview Trey Stevens, who I've interviewed many times uh, about uh, his knowledge of the defense industry and the future of defense technology. And I think more than anyone practicing investing today and looking at this space, Trey has sort of an encyclopedic knowledge of why we are in the state we're in today and what we can do about it. Um, so really excited to, to chat with you today, Trey. Excited to be here. Always fun to hang out. Yeah. So so want to start with, you know, we as an industry, it's been very interesting to watch the last 30 years in terms of, you know, you, you hear reports coming out of the Department of Defense saying we are at near peer uh, status with Russia and China, uh, that the advances in technology that have happened in the last 30 years, we have not been able to necessarily keep up. I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of what went wrong. Uh, you know, the Cold War ended 30 years ago. We were supposed to be the hegemonic power as the U.S. What what happened that that Russia and China were able to keep uh, to catch up uh, with the U.S. in terms of defense innovation? Yeah, I mean, there's there's probably a lot of reasons. Um, we can discuss like some of them at a high level. Uh, you know, there was a, this kind of famous uh, meeting that happened where the Secretary of Defense kind of gathered the defense industry together and said uh, people called the Last Supper. And basically, he said, uh, there's too many of you. Uh, defense spending is going to go down now that the Cold War is over, and you should consolidate, basically. Um, and we went from having kind of a pretty diverse set of uh, industry companies that were working on different priorities to, you know, really like five big, what, what's called primes. Um, and we, we locked into this really long-term planning uh, process for building large platforms, whether that's you know, fifth generation uh, fighter planes like the F-35, which uh, the program for the F-35 is um, almost 25 years old now, um, or it's over 25 years old now. Um, and four class aircraft carrier, you know, the Ohio class submarine. So like these really big platforms. Uh, and that prevented us from being agile in like avoiding hitting the obsolescence curve. So like, you know, the things that we were planning for the F-35 25 years ago are clearly not the things that you would deploy if you were to build a system from scratch today. Um, and so we, we just kind of got stuck in this like bureaucratic sludge. And, um, you know, China and Russia, on the other hand, had a very different approach. They were really like kind of building out a capacity for the first time. Uh, they knew that they needed to move much more agilely than we were. And they also had the benefit of being able to basically steal a lot of our most valuable IP. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they kind of leaned in in a different way than we did. Yeah. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, it it's troubling to think that when you think of what's happened with consumer internet over the last 30 years, there's been hundreds of companies that have reached, you know, unicorn status, the the market cap of, of just the, the growth of the internet has, has just changed the entire country, if not the entire world. And when you look at defense innovation, we have SpaceX, Palantir, and Anduril. So I'd love to hear what you think went wrong in terms of, you know, the, the defense industry used to be sort of at the forefront of pushing innovation forward. It's why we have the Internet. Uh, why is it so hard for defense companies in the last 30 years to succeed? Yeah. I, I mean, during the Cold War, it was the most aspirational career you could pursue was one that was generally going to be funded by the Department of Defense, whether that was you know rocket technology to get us to the moon or um, building networking technologies with DARPA or building next generation radars, radios, you know, all of that. It was, these were the highly aspirational engineering careers. Uh, when the Cold War ended and the internet became more of a commercialized phenomenon, uh, the, the talent that we had kind of built up over 50 years or nearly 50 years um, started bleeding out into the pri into private industry. Uh, and it, it could have been like really interesting, incredible things. Uh, like, you know, computing, uh, or it could be like really silly things like, you know, selling dog food online. Um, and today I would argue that like the engineers that we really need to be focused on these issues of national importance in our country are, are probably, you know, more than likely uh, working at a large tech company optimizing ads. And, um, and so it really is just like a talent direction problem. Uh, and, you know, the, the three companies that you mentioned, Palantir, SpaceX, and Anduril, what, what I, the really kind of obvious yet non-obvious thing that makes them pretty unique is that they were all founded by billionaires. And the reason this ends up being really important is that, you know, a, tech, a typical startup has, you know, they raise enough capital for like, call it 18 to 24 months of runway. Um, 
problematically, 18 to 24 months of runway is shorter than uh, the uh, transition curve for a defense contract. So going from you know, prototype to pilot to production usage of a technology could, could take as long as five, six, seven years. Um, and so being able to kind of fundraise your way through the valley of death becomes really problematic unless you have a billionaire that can kind of do that for you. Um, and so there are some unfair advantages that are built, built into the, just the capital structure of companies like that, I would say. Do you know, I, you know, I've heard you talk about this message before. I've certainly talked about this message before in my conversations with, you know, DOD officials and that sort of thing. Do you think the message is getting through that, that the timeline of these sales cycles is just not compatible with what is what has emerged as the predominant way of funding innovation, which is venture capital? For, for sure. Yeah. I think people are starting to recognize that this is true. Obviously, Catherine, like you and I have both been in conversations where, you know, senior government people have started parroting some of these lines about the, the problem with the Valley of Death and with billionaire co-founders. Um, you know, we've kind of slipped into this kind of concept of a Howard Hughes model for entrepreneurship, just like uh, we need the eccentric billionaire to make anything work. Uh, this is parodied all over popular culture with things like Stark Industries and Iron Man. Um, this isn't the future that we want necessarily. It would be much better if we had a future where like the best technology could just win. Um, but th there is an increasing awareness of, of this shortfall. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think there's still a lot of problems around the Valley of Death uh, where, you know, we have a lot of systems that are being built on the front end of that to manage like the pipe getting into initial contract. Uh, so there's things like, the Defense Innovation Unit that does early stage OTAs. There's AFWorks, SoftWorks um, that are doing um, uh, SBIR programs, the Small Business Innovative Research program yeah. to do initial pilot contracts. There's things like Inkytel that do work programs for pilots and prototypes with uh, venture-backed tech companies. Uh, but there's still not a whole lot of bridging kind of tissue that exists right now. Um, mm -hmm. And while there's an awareness that it is a problem, there hasn't been a whole lot of effort, at least that I've seen, that has gone into like actually correcting that. But curious yeah. if you've seen well, things, I haven't for sure. Well, no, and, and, and that's, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually my next question. Like you have seen since 2015, since the emergence of the OTA, which is the other transaction authority, which allows startups to be able to get contracts in a short period of time, say more on a startup, you know, time horizon of 30 days. Yeah, a early stage company will get that contract and then it's like, well, now what? That's a million dollar contract. Great. It's wonderful. Like it's, you know, it can help us move forward for, for 12 to 18 months. But when do you get a production contract? So I guess like the, the question that I would have is, you know, I think everyone knows that that's a problem. If you were designing either new procurement processes or if you were pushing the DOD to say, you know, here's, here's how you should work with startups, what would the ideal sort of you know, ideal sort of procurement reform be in order to make sure that startups can be part of this DOD ecosystem? Yeah, I, I mean, this is probably like the most common question, probably you as well, Catherine, get asked by members yeah. of Congress and um, senior leaders inside the DOD. And I think part of the problem with this general question is that to a policy person, every policy nail needs a policy hammer. It's like yep. the problem, the reason why this isn't working is because we need to reform the way the procurement system works. But if you go and you look at like the intricacies of the, the procurement system, like it's actually, you could easily make the decision, the right decision. Uh, mm -hmm. We just don't. Uh, so I would say it's like more of a cultural problem than it is a procurement problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's this uh, really uh, obscure acquisition law called US Title 10 2377. Uh, that you can just you could google that and it would come back um it's uh it's about commercial preference and so the law says that the government is not allowed to build something from scratch that they can buy off the shelf the problem is, is that there's no accountability in this law no one actually enforces its uh its existence and so the government will come in and say here are my 100 requirements and then when a commercial company steps up and says we can provide that exact thing out of the box and the government goes back and adds 20 requirements that that product doesn't have. Now they can be like, oh, you, you only fulfill 100 of the 120 requirements, so we're going to build it ourselves. Um, and this happens over and over and over again. Um, there's this really kind of well-known story of government contracting failure uh, that's still in production use called DTS, the Defense Travel System, um, which is where uh, civilians and soldiers inside the DOD 
uh, book travel to be reimbursed. So they have to pay personal uh, payment uh, and then it gets reimbursed in some ridiculous schedule, like 100 days or something on average uh, before they get a reimbursement check. If you think this sounds like Concur, it's because it is exactly like Concur. And yet we, we the taxpayer, uh, have budgeted with the Department of Defense $450 million over five years to build this from scratch with Northrop Grumman because they have unique special requirements or something like that. I mean, it doesn't actually make sense. Um, but this is like rinsed and repeated probably dozens, if not hundreds of times across the DOD. Um, and we can, we, we can certainly do a much better job with this than, than we have been. Um, yeah. but it's really just a cultural problem. Like we just have to do the right thing. And aside from just talking about this, I mean, I've heard you talk about this before. I've heard other people in government talk about this before. Obviously, you know, the the government wants to save taxpayers money because of this and, 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 and buy commercial you know, products. What can be done in terms of changing the culture? Is it just is it just having these conversations and making sure that, that people know actually there are off the shelf, you know, software solutions and hardware solutions that could actually work for DOD? Or is it something you know, more extreme than that? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that the problem is that there's no awareness that these commercial products exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just that the incentives for using the commercial product don't necessarily make sense. I'll give you yeah. a good reason. Let's say that you are a senior official in the Department of Defense. And by the way, most senior, when I, I'll say this, but most senior officials would disagree with this characterization because it's, it reflects on them very poorly. But let's say you have a budget of $100 million. There's probably a pretty good chance that you're making, uh, as, a, as an employee of the federal government, somewhere in the, let's call it 125 to 175K a year range, which is basically cap for a senior executive inside the US government. Mm -hmm. um, you do not have the ability to get promoted uh, to a new salary bracket. You don't have the ability to get a bonus. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, you're basically at a position where as the owner of a large budget, the only way that you have to demonstrate your seniority and your responsibility is to acquire more budget. But Congress says if you don't spend all of the money that you've been given responsibility for in a year, that the next year they will allocate the the right amount of money, which is less than the amount that you spent this year. So if I'm sitting on $100 million and I'm spending really efficiently uh, and only spend $70 million in my $100 million budget, but do it more effectively and more efficiently, next year I'm going to get $70 or $80 million. So I'm mm -hmm. losing authority. I'm losing status. I'm losing yeah. reputation inside of the organization. Um, and so oftentimes what you'll see is that someone goes to the Congress and they say, I need $10 billion dollars. To, to build out this acquisition program for some new combat vehicle, or you, know, you could plug in, pl plug and play, whatever you want into that budget. Um, and then you expect them to come back and say, just kidding, I only needed 3 billion. I did it way more efficiently than, than I said I was going to. No, yeah. that's, that's crazy. They would never do that. Yeah. No, and it's interesting because there's also this meme that government doesn't like to pick winners that the winners have already been picked over history and they're the, the five primes that you discussed, the, the big five. How do we change that meme and that, or is it even necessary? Yeah. Um, I, I think that like, it, it really comes down to like enforcement at some level, like, mm -hmm. you know, convincing people that the right thing to do is, is pushing forward with, this commercial product strategy um, without getting hung up on all of these like ancillary concerns that they have. Uh, oftentimes mm -hmm. you'll hear things brought up like um, access to sor source code for vulnerability scanning or whatever, or um, government data licensing or, um, you know, so on and so forth. And with, with the primes, you know, what they basically are able to negotiate is if I'm building this from scratch, then the government will own generally will own the IP. Um, mm -hmm. And so, in theory, five years down the line, if I don't want to use Raytheon anymore, I can fire Raytheon and recompete it, hire Northrop Grumman, hand them all the source code, and then everything's fine. You move on with the program. And it's just like commoditized service contracts at that point. If yeah. you buy a commercial product and there's some sort of exclusive license that's involved in that commercial product, um, in theory, at least the government believes that it's going to be really hard for them to like fire you and bring in someone to replace you if they're kind of like required to use the IP stack uh, that, that they've licensed from you. Yeah. Um, the reason that this is an in theory conversation is that these contractors don't get fired. Like not, 
we hired Lockheed Martin to build the F-35 20 plus years ago. We're going to complete the program with Lockheed Martin. Uh, it's actually not any different than using a commercial product. As, as far as like the picking winners thing goes, you know, I think that the corollary to this that isn't discussed but is equally important is what does it mean if you don't pick winners? It means everyone is a loser. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so like it, by definition, if you don't pick winners, there are no winners. Uh, yeah. and, and that's something that I think we really need to correct. Yeah. I want to talk more about the the founder side and kind of what Silicon Valley can do, because it does feel like, uh, you know, there are so many talented entrepreneurs that want to work with government. And, you know, you've done a lot of work in this space and the message has changed. I think that, you know, over the last five years, uh, the DOD and, you know, investors here have made it possible to have these conversations about how do we work with government but it's still much more difficult than selling to enterprise and much more difficult than, than you know, operating the consumer space in terms of all these challenges. So I'd love to hear what your advice is to founders who say, I want to work in defense and I know it's going to be harder, uh, but, but I want to do this. Like what, what's your main advice to them about how they can navigate this? I, there are places to go. I mean, there, there are companies that you could go and work for. Um, mm -hmm. Palantir Spacex and Andrel are the, the three biggest, um, but there are a lot of other really good companies like Shield AI is doing some really interesting stuff in autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. There's some really cool companies in like the modeling simulation space, like Improbable AI Reverie. Um, there's interesting companies in hypersonics like um, Hermaeus and Ursa Major. So there, there are a growing number of startups that are working in the ecosystem. Um, similarly, there are innovation organizations inside the government that could be really interesting places to work, like the Defense Digital Service, which is kind of like a internal, you know, software factory inside of the Pentagon, um, or places like Incutel, where they're facilitating work programs for venture back companies, or DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit out of Mountain View. Um, so increasingly, I think there are a lot of options. Um, the narrative is really bizarre, though, as as I'm sure most people listening to this know, where like people believe that Silicon Valley is like adverse or, or thinks very negatively about working with the Department of Defense. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at like the petitions, famously, you know, Google pulled out of Project Maven or decided not to renew their contract with Project, project Maven, which is an AI project inside the Pentagon, um, after a group of angry employees like basically wrote a letter to Sundar Pichai saying that they were uncomfortable with the work on uh, the government program. Um, there were like 5,000 signatories to that out of you know hundreds of thousands of Google employees. And we're talking about like tiny percentages of people that have uh, expressed any concern. Um, not to mention that like, there's no evidence that the people that were signing that letter were even US citizens. So it's like, if you're a citizen of China working uh, on like an H-1B visa with, with Google, like of course you don't want Google working with the United States military. That would be crazy. Why would you want that? Yeah. Um, and so, the, you know, no one's really talking about this in as nuanced a way as they probably should be. Um, I think generally speaking, there are a lot of people that would be really interested to work on this stuff and there are places where you can go to do it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to ask more of a personal question because you've been obviously work, you know, you have an interesting background of having worked in government, worked at Palantir, co-founded Anduril, you know, I think a lot of people five years ago would have laughed in your face if you said, I want to build uh, the next great defense prime. But Anduril has been just an extraordinary success this far. And I just love to hear, you know, what's the biggest surprise? You're, you're, you're a company builder as well as an investor. What is the biggest surprise of building a company in this space, given that you are paving the way for a future in which there can be multiple uh, defense innovation companies that are working on these hard problems? Yeah, I Man, I mean, there's so many like crazy things that we learned. Um, so but prior to being at Founders Fund and long prior to starting Andrel, um, I was one of the first employees at Palantir and kind of rode this rodeo for six years before um, before leaving to join Founders. Um, and, you know, things were a lot harder than any of us expected that they would be. Um, but, you know, doing it the second time around with Andrel, we've really been able to kind of stand on the shoulders of giants so in, in a turn of phrase, um, because, you know, Palantir and SpaceX both sued their customers and won those lawsuits, uh, which opened up like a path of legal precedence for doing what it is that we're doing. Um, and there's also an increasing awareness inside the department of the gaps that exist in, in solving this problem. Um, but, you know, like one kind of crazy lesson that we learned is that selling software as a product to the DOD is incredibly hard. 
um, they they view it almost as like this egalitarian thing that like anybody can do it. Like they're yeah. willing to pay margins on hardware, but software is like, oh, it's just it's just code. Like I can hire 15 monkeys that can like crank out the same quality of code as, you know, freaking Google or whatever, which is just completely mind boggling. Yeah. Um, but if you do really complex software and then basically wrap it in aluminum foil, you can sell it to them as hardware. And as long as they can count it, they no longer view it as being egalitarian, um, which makes no sense. But uh, there are like hacks like that that you can employ that I think accelerate the process and make things significantly easier. Yeah. So I want to, you know, end on a positive note. I think, you know, when government has seen so many, you know, the excitement and enthusiasm coming from Silicon Valley, you know, I'm an investor in a number of government related companies, as are you. There's a number of firms that are really excited. I think it's led to greater collaboration. But I'm curious when you think of like, you know, the next decade of collaboration between Silicon Valley companies, not necessarily based in Silicon Valley, but companies that build in the ethos of venture capital and the Department of Defense. You know, what do you think that future looks like? How do we increase the collaboration? And and do you think that there's going to be tremendous change in, in the next decade, given given some of the conversations you've had over the last few years? I mean, Silicon Valley and venture investing in particular responds to results. And so <laughs> the like kind of dark version of this is that if there aren't any success stories, then there isn't any venture capital. And if there isn't any venture capital, then there aren't any companies that are doing it. <laughs> Um, yeah. I hope that that won't be the case. Um, but I do see that there are some tailwinds that we've been kind of chasing for the last, you know, really, even it's after Andrew, really, like the last two, two and a half years, um, that I think that there will likely be a handful of really good venture returns um, in the defense space. And the DOD uh, will have kind of like a cultural shift over time as a new generation of people that understand software, that understand autonomy, that understand the importance of artificial intelligence, uh, will infuse that into the department in a way that's really accretive to working with the private sector. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there is like an alternate version of this, this future that I think we should be avoiding. Um, and that is like this broad software factory model where like the DOD starts believing um, that it can build all of these things internally in-house. Um, and there, there's like a, a slight movement in this direction. You have like the Air Force Kessel Run, Kessel Run program. You have a software factory that's built, being built out of Army Futures Command. Um, obviously DDS, the Defense Social Service, which I mentioned before. And there's probably some things that we should be doing um, custom in-house inside the Pentagon. So I don't wanna like say that all those efforts are bad. Um, but if we truly try to scale this up and say, like, we're going to build all modeling and simulation ourselves, we're going to build all wargaming ourselves, we're going to build all the flight control systems ourselves, like, it's going to get into this place where, again, you're just using, you know, a lot of resources to do things that are already being done more effectively by the private sector. And I, I hope that that's not the way it goes. Yeah. And in and, and final words, any, like, uh, you know, if there's anything you could ask of Washington and Silicon Valley founders, what would it be? Um, you know, like, is, is there anything that like, it, it, obviously there's no silver bullets here and you've been working on this for, for decades, but is there anything where, you know, we are starting, I mean, what's, what's interesting is we're at an interesting time given that it's a, uh, you know, election just happened, uh, looks like given, given the results we're seeing that there will be a transition. It's a, it's a new decade. Uh, you know, is there anything, is there any ask of, of both the founder side and the, and the government side? Yeah, I think on the government side, it's, you know, be open to conversations about commercial technology um, and recognize the places where you have absolute advantages rather than relative assumptions about advantages. Um, you know, it's, I think it's, I, I oftentimes talk about this story where like my mom is, hates basketball, but she went to my basketball games growing up and, you know, she would leave and she'd be like, oh, wow, that kid was really good at basketball. But then like, uh, I was in high school when LeBron James was in high school in Ohio, and uh, he's not playing the same game. But like, if you're assessing everything on a relative basis, like you could say that the people on my team are good at basketball. But th they're not even like Division three basketball players. This is the same thing that's happening inside the Pentagon. Is we're looking, you can look around and say like, on a relative basis, that guy's really good at, at building software or building whatever. But on an absolute basis, it, we're not even playing the same ball game. And that's yeah. something that I think they need to recognize. Um, on the founder side. You know, I, I, I wrote about this actually in an ethics piece um, about why 
I think it's important to invest and build defense technology companies. And I would encourage founders to think critically about this, that there are things in the world that, uh, that are easy and feel good. And there are things that are easy and feel bad. And you, know, you could plot out the quad chart. Um, as a Silicon Valley culture, we are remarkably bad at things that are important and good that don't feel good. Um, mm -hmm. We tend to just be very feely people. Um, defense is one of those things. You can't just not do defense. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the alternative is far worse uh, than you know the pill that you have to take to get there. And I would just encourage people to think critically about the importance of doing hard things that don't feel good. Um, so that we as millennials, of which I'm one and Catherine, you're one as well, I guess, um, that we just aren't particularly well suited to address because of our emotional, you know, coddling or whatever it was as children. There are things that are really important and very ethically good that are not going to feel emotionally good. And we yeah. just need to rem remember that. Yeah, no, and one thing I'll add and having watched, you know, the, the founding story of Andrew and seen your success thus far is that you know, there was a meme going around, and I think it still goes around in some media circles that, you know, Silicon Valley doesn't want to work on defense. And there, that, that could not be farther from the truth. I think the media has to stop that narrative. It is so clear that this is a bipartisan, important issue, uh, and that founders are excited about the hard engineering problems. And, and to your point, it's a hard problem, but that's what gets people up in the morning. So the, the thing that I would ask uh, Washington and, and founders to, to do is to ignore that, to ignore that narrative, because it's, it's not true and it's becoming less true by the minute. And it's so exciting to see, uh, you know, what you've done in terms of, of paving the way for a lot of these other companies that are just so excited to work with the DOD. So thank you for that. Well said, well said. Awesome. Well, it's always great to, to chat about uh, chat about defense and Andrew and, and um, looking forward to some of the other panels in uh, this afternoon. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Good